Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Conspiracy Farm, where we don't start the conspiracies, we just add the water. And now, your host of the most state-of-the-art, most informed podcast on the interweb, I present to you, Pat Militage and Jeffrey Wilson. Ladies and gentlemen, are you ready for... Cool, very much so. Whoa, I'm very excited. Very cool. Uh, we are locked and loaded, ladies and gentlemen, for another episode, another edition, another volume for the archives of the Conspiracy Farm. Where, ladies and gentlemen, we don't find the conspiracies. We just uh, we we don't start them. Actually, we just add a little water to the ones that already are there. And today, whoa, be still my beating heart because this is a passion of mine. This conversation. Uh, ancient civilizations, etc. This gentleman and some of the work that he's a part of kind of kind of broke the internet a couple weeks ago uh, with the find, the controversial find of the uh, mummified uh, humanoid kind of remains. We're going to get into it, but this comes on the heels of uh, our guest finding, um, for lack of a better term, a, a hand of a similar, I don't know if it's similar or not, but another three-handed kind of humanoid. This gentleman is a... Three fingered. I'm sorry. Uh, this gentleman is an author. He is a kind of right now a Peruvian based researcher of a great many of books. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the program, Mr. Brian Forrester. How are you, sir? Thank you. For, thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here. And I, of course, am always joined by my sidekick running shotgun with me is UFC Hall of Famer Pat Miller. How are you doing today, sir? I'm doing great. I'm just excited to get into this with Brian. I mean, I've I've always been somebody who's been fascinated with the potential of, you know, uh, intelligence from other other areas of the universe. And, you know, to be I guess it would be to, you'd be very naive to not think that we are accompanied by folks on other parts of, uh, of our universe of, of the galaxy. And uh, Brian finding this stuff is. It's mind-boggling, and I'm I'm excited to to not only ask him questions, but even be, I guess, devil's advocate to a certain extent to help him prove what he's found. Yeah, without a doubt. I mean, very controversial, Mr. Forrester. If you don't mind, I mean, give us a little background on yourself, a gentleman who's now finds himself, you know, like I said, author of many books. You work with a huge hero of mine, Mr. Graham Hancock. How did you find yourself down in the areas of Peru doing the work that you do, sir? Well, I basically always followed my my passions. So um, I've never followed a conventional lifestyle. Like I did, I grew up in Canada, born in the U.S., um, went to university and got a degree in sciences. But after six months of being employed in that, I got quite bored. So I took up uh, my passion full time, which was uh, carving totem poles on the west coast of Canada. And after a period of time, that led me to uh, travel through Polynesia. I lived in Hawaii for a while and helped build a giant voyaging canoe. And once I'd finished my interest in Polynesia, I just decided one morning that I should go and visit Peru. And as soon as I got here about 12 years ago, I was fascinated by the megalithic constructions that you find, especially in the Cusco area, but also more recently these elongated skulls that um, actually are found in many different parts of Peru and Bolivia. So that's uh, that's why I'm still here. Now, and in, in previously they thought that, you know, a lot of people basically hypothesized that that was from the wrapping of skulls that, that even um, people in different parts of the world do currently, right? Right, that's right. And what would what would I guess show you or tell you that that a skull has been wrapped or has not? Is, are there ways of telling that? Yeah, there are. There are, uh, since I've been studying hundreds of these, um, I've developed the idea that probably about ninety five percent of them are cranial deformation or or head wrapping of people of noble heritage um, in different cultures, mainly the Paracas, but also the Inca perform this as well, but more recently, we've been able to isolate about 5% of them, which are very complex in their shape. Um, when we show these to medical professionals, they, they can't figure out what they're looking at because of the morphological differences, and we've been able to isolate one specific cemetery, uh, actually one small part of one specific cemetery 
near Paracas, Peru, where these natural-looking elongated skulls are found. Wow. So yeah. have, D- have DNA tests been done on these skulls, or, or even the three-fingered subject you've found? Well, the yeah, we've we've done initial testing on four skulls from Peru, three of them from Paracas, and their genetic ancestry indicates that they are either European or Middle Eastern in origin. They're not Native American, and these people died out two thousand years ago, so it's unlikely that they crossed the Bering Land Bridge. But more recently, we have samples through working with the Peruvian government of 21 different skulls from the Paracas area, and those tests are being conducted right now. So were were any of these skulls, and I'm sorry to hog the microphone. No, go for it, Pat. Go for it, please. Were were all of these skulls, most of them intact, or had any had damage to them as as if they had been murdered, or um, like showing a slaughter that these people were taken over by by, um, by a new group of people? Yeah, that's a, actually an excellent point. There's one site called Camacho that has this, this mass grave. Um, in general, people of, of noble heritage, like these elongated skull people, were, um, were buried very ceremoniously, I- individually or in uh, family mausoleums. Uh, but in the case of this, uh, this one area um, all of the skeletons and skulls have, have basically been smashed as if it's it was genocide and these were all skulls also from about 2000 years ago uh, approximately but all of them um, show signs of cranial deformation because the backs of the skulls are are flattened which is an indication of cranial deformation as compared to the five percent that I just talked about that uh, are far yeah, more rounded and complicated so somebody wanted to get rid of the imposters <laughs> yeah and, and and i actually i think well at least my theory is that it's the nazca people who moved into the area that performed the genocide okay okay good stuff no very good stuff wow where do we begin yeah i mean there's so much to it and i mean I, i've i've always been obviously a huge fan of history we get into geopolitics quote unquote conspiracy which is kind of just history under another name but something that's always fascinated me is you know ancient cartography ancient civilizations the mystery stool mystery schools things that just go way back you know prehistory of history because as doing my show research you know like you have said and even Graham has said, you know, we're kind of a civilization with amnesia. And we, we, we weren't this, like, uh, you know, knuckle-dragging civilization that now um, ascended to this, you know, cool status that we are now. What, what are your thoughts, you know, on that? Where did this hypothesize, if you will? Because, of course, you have your Edgar Case, You have all these hypotheses of Atlantis in this technology kind of spread throughout the world. China, Central America, South America. Where do you think this came from, this technology, if you will? Hypothesize, if you will. Uh, Well, I guess I would have to hypothesize because the the problem is that academics don't look upon the megalithic works as being something that was done with superior technology. But if if you take anyone like an engineer or a stonemason on location, when they look at this stuff, they say, I don't know what tools I have in the 21st century that could perform that. So it's obvious that Bronze Age civilizations like the Inca did not do this work, and that means that you have to look farther back in time. There are no real oral traditions or records of anyone existing in the area. So either somebody came with superior technology from quote-unquote Atlantis, or I'm not um, close to the idea that it was done by off-world beings. Completely within the realm of possibility, simply because, you know, like we've talked about so many times, you know, the history that we know is so been sanitized. It's almost like the light spectrum. We can only see so much of it. Um, and there, there's so much more existing that's outside of it. Um, well, I mean, Pat, do, do you have any more? I mean, obviously we got more, but I just, I kind of have my little talking points here. Anything you want to jump in here with them? Patrick, are you there? Hello? To any of our listeners who are not into this at all, basically thinking that Jeffrey's a moon bat, he's not. Jeffrey's <laughs> Jeffrey's actually fairly intelligent. 
Much Barely. Come on, Patrick. <laughs> and our guest qualifying. is by far uh, more intelligent than I am. But, okay, so I'm going to go even one further. Um, since we're mentioning potential um, aliens, uh, are you familiar at all with the ancient star maps by, you know, and I'm sure you are, obviously, with all the studying you've done, the, the same set of um, – with Sol 1, Sol 2, Sol 3, their sun stars, three of them, um, Orion, Pleiades, uh, all these maps in ancient worlds that were carved or even set up in giant stone form, um, the uh, pyramids, setups, things like that. So, and basically, I'm doing this for our listeners, where these maps have been found in Egypt, uh, in uh, Samaria, the Stonehenge, even um, New Mexico, in the Chico Canyon. I think in, what is it, Wyoming, near Devil's Tower, in India, and obviously in Peru where you're at. So all of these things through ancient history, all of these ancient civilizations had these maps of the same stars, these three main stars, where I think they basically all thought that human origins came from. Am I correct in, in saying this? Yeah, you're, you're very correct, because there are many different indigenous cultures that speak of their origins being from very specific star systems. The, the Pleiades is probably the most common, and that would be, I think, kind of odd if there was no fact or facts based on it, because the Pleiades are not a significant-looking system in the heavens, but then, of course, you also have Sirius and, and other star systems that are mentioned by many, many different cultures. Okay. And this Wayne Herschel on this this uh, website, people can go to it, it's called thehiddenrecords.com, um, with these three stars. Wayne Herschel interviewed an elderly uh, Freemason. I'm a Freemason, and that's how I ended up stumbling upon this. Uh, one of my broadcast partners, uh, Michael Cervello, who's a Mason, showed me this website, and, and we actually researched it together. And the commonalities of the three stars, and then in Masonry, the number three is re- reoccurring all the time. Um, the pillars of, of Freemasonry, the, the the minor and major three lights of Masonry, it just goes on and on and on. Three steps, um, the three degrees, it, it just goes on and on. And so it's it's very intriguing. So any of our listeners want to go to thehiddenrecords.com and, and check this out. It's it's some it's some pretty wild stuff for a guy to read who was raised as a Catholic. Trust me. <laughs> well, it's something I have found. Did you ever respond to that, Mister Forrest? I'm sorry. Um, actually, I had the the great fortune to go to the Masonic Hall in Washington D.C. I think about a year and a half ago, and it was amazing how much uh, how big their library was of esoteric material. So it's uh, I I have great great respect for the for the masons i know that they've been bashed about by people mm-hmm. probably who who don't know what they're talking about over the course of hundreds of years but i found um all of the Im- all of the imagery and symbolism inside and outside the the masonic hall absolutely fascinating and of course based on egyptian and and um sumerian and other mystery schools so Kudos to them. And ultimately, that's kind of where I think all of these conversations go to, you know, the, the mathematics of it all and this technology that we're just not quite hip to. And, you know, again, man, kudos to for, to you for coming on this show because, like I said, you, you guys kind of broke the Internet with this find the other day. And I've been a studier of this, you know, researcher of this for a long time. And I know you know who Zahi Awas is over in Egypt. You know, it, if I were to contact, and I've contacted Zahi Awas many times, and it's just impossible to get in touch with him to have an interview, I contacted you about you know ten to thirteen days ago, and here you are on the show speaking about you know almost very same breakthrough information. Uh, but as far as you know, Zahi Awas goes, he's an Egyptologist, or he was, and is very much so covetous of the um uh, whatever the, the narrative that keeps us away from what we're talking about or the mystery school stuff. So. Uh, hello? Yeah. Did I lose Pat? Anyway, um, but so again, thank you, thank you so very much for coming on because that's, you, uh, what do you account for that difference, sir? Like, uh, you know, the PR campaign put up by your mainstream Egyptologists and somebody like yourself who has been very open and willing to have these conversations. Well, the problem with um, academia, which I also encountered when I was in university, was that 
it's kind of a closed network and people think that science is all about discovery and new ideas and things like that but anything which is even mildly controversial tends to be shunned and so Egyptology is one of those belief systems that um, is is very uh, much a closed school and I, I believe Zahi Hawass is, is, is and was very much part of that because Egypt has depended for probably a hundred years on foreign funding as in foreign universities coming in and doing excavations and things like that um, their paradigm is not to be questioned so if you Again, if, if you look at structures such as the Great Pyramid, it would have been impossible for the dynastic Egyptians to have built it. You know, plain and simple. If you bring any engineer to Egypt and have them look at it, it doesn't matter how many people you had working on it, how many bronze tools you, you, know, you had, it would have been impossible. And um, That's just one simple example. The same in Peru. You have these megalithic works that, that could not have been constructed even today because the technology is is honestly beyond our capability so you're looking at advanced ancient civilizations that uh, conventional academia is trying to cover up but the more you bring science into it the more it's revealing that um, there were advanced ancient civilizations when without a doubt and there's nothing more emblematic of that when when I and I loved it it was almost like a Pat Militant UFC fight it was when Graham Hancock squared off against Zahi Awas and it was so anticlimactic because Zahi Awas as you know the petulant human being that he was kind of stormed <laughs> off and didn't even have the conversation and you know Graham is as much of a you know I'm sorry you know you such he's he's such a stud like he's just very chill and you know very confident and you know, he doesn't know everything, but he has certain, you know, considerations which suggest certain things. And Zahi didn't even want to have the conversation. So, no, it's 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 really become sad how they do go through such measures to protect the uh, the order, if you will. And then, you know, we have all these things. You know, what are your thoughts? Go Beckley Tepe. You know, this thing is this is one of those things that's just been found in the last 20 some years in Turkey, you know, that dates. You know, this this is the stuff that shuffles the deck and really kind of makes them predate their conventional wisdom. What are your thoughts on finds like megalithic structures like Gobekli Tepe? Well, the, you know, one of the one of the great things about Graham is that he was very courageous to put out put out his book Fingerprints of the Gods, and very courageous to put up with decades of abuse from academia. But what he brings to the table is he brings actual logic and facts. And so that was the problem, I guess, with his encounter with Zahi Hawass, is that the latter did not want to debate him and um, debate the facts that were being put on the table. He simply stormed off. And so that tells you, obviously, that um, Graham was, if there was to be a debate, Graham would have easily won it because he, br he brought data. He didn't bring simply a belief system um, you know, which is more or less what conventional Egyptology is. Well, and, and the way Zahi just stormed off, it was just it just was proven because you know anybody who's been around for the last fifteen twenty years who, who's understood this this story, you've seen the work of not just yourself, Graham Hancock, Robert Bouval, John Anthony West, that just really throws a huge monkey wrench in everything that Egyptologists and conventional wisdom um, speaks of. So, you know, kudos again to you guys for. Um, continuing with this work because it really does um it really does uh really does quite shuffle the deck and this is kind of the this is the information that we need because as you said before there's so much we've been lied about and as uh, graham said we've we're a species with uh with amnesia if you will no it's great to, it's great to ruffle the feathers and i want to you know ask also you know how many scientists researchers people that are are experts in this field on mummification and history and and these ancient civilizations that have that have been allowed to inspect the mummy. I mean, obviously, it's your find. You you want to be protective of it somewhat. But I know that I think you've allowed some some Russian uh, scientists to look at it. Are there any others that have looked at it? And the hand you know, was your find. The mummy was not your find. Correct. Okay. Let's okay. Just, correct. Just, just to differentiate. Correct. Just to be okay, sure. Okay, but <clears throat> and um, would it be would it be good to? And I think, are you filming these people as they're inspecting it, what they're saying, things like that, and even bringing down people who are calling it complete a complete hoax 
and bringing them in and allowing them to to inspect and and, and look at the hand and the full and, litmus uh, test, the full yeah yeah. Brian. Hello. Yeah, well, the base, actually, the basic story behind this is that I was contacted by a French researcher in Cusco who said he had these very strange um, artifacts, and so he sent me photographs of a small uh, reptilian-looking head and this little body. Uh, so I went to see them, and uh, I recognized that they were skin and bone of some kind, and then after that, um, another researcher who lives in, in Cusco uh, brought the three-fingered hand to me to look at, as well as an x-ray. And again, the hand looked like it was bone and skin of some kind. Um, but that's, as, that's more or less as far as I took it until uh, Gaia TV and also Jaime Mausan from Mexico came down because they had been given a tip that there was a full mummy uh, to be inspected, and they invited me along to see it, but the logistics just became a nightmare because originally we were supposed to go to the actual location where, where the finds were made, and then that morning the contact phoned uh, so, uh, one of these people and, and said, no, no, we have to meet in another location, and at that point I began to become a little suspicious so I, I didn't go with them, but Jaime and Gaia TV went, and that's where they documented on video the mummy. They brought supposedly a forensic expert from Mexico with them. So what I've been doing since then is, is I'm just waiting. Supposedly there's going to be a, a massive announcement tomorrow in really? Lima. Whoa. Yeah, but, but also um, this morning I watched actually a video – by a, a German taxidermist who looked at the video itself and x-rays, and he thinks it's a fabrication. He thinks that it is a mummy uh, from about 2,000 years ago, but that somebody has altered the hands and the feet. So that's why I'm sort of on the, on the back burner with this one. Well, at the same time, though, I, I think there was a, an x-ray technician uh, and a, a doctor who were both looking at the x-rays and said that it's very unlikely that somebody could have pulled this off the way it looks like the bone structure belongs the way it is. Mr. Forrester. Monsieur Hello? Forrester. Still there? Well, actually, actually, the, the taxidermist um, today said he thinks that extra digits were added. Uh, that don't properly fit in fit in place. The phalanges. And actually, they were added to the, the phalanges. Yeah, and actually, the major problem I have with it is that the form of mummification is not typical of any culture in Peru, especially the coating of this white clay material. The white clay is found all over the Nazca area, um, but there is no culture that would coat. A, a body with clay in order to mummify it. So that, again, that's why I'm kind of <coughs> not spending too much time on this. I'm going to wait until the big announcement tomorrow and see how much more data comes up. Supposedly, they don't have any DNA results yet. Uh, DNA results on ancient um, mummies and, and human parts in general are very complicated. There are only 10 labs in the world that can properly analyze them. So that might take another month or two um, I'm very interested in, in the study but the results are still not too deep I think at this point okay so are you skeptical about the three-fingered hand that you found uh, I am now um, because actually the man who, who brought the brought the hand to show me he, he went <clears throat> excuse me he went to a, a medical expert in Cusco who looked at it, and he, he believes that the extra phalanges were added mm. and that the reason for the coating was to cover up the, the, <coughs> excuse me, the surgery that was done. That's interesting. Now, yeah. yeah. I think from but, a forensic standpoint, that yeah, that would be able to be ascertained pretty, pretty you know, 
without a problem, quite frankly. I mean, that's when you start adding bones and you're talking about tissue, et cetera, et cetera. What, um, Pat, Pat, were you about to ask something there? I'm sorry. Well, I was just going to ask, you know, as far as the, the elongated skulls, the 5% that he's found that, um, you know, in, in your mind are legitimate skulls that were that way genetically, um, you know, at least, you know, saying that, that those are credible, only 5% are credible. The rest um, have been altered throughout the person's life, things like that, and then potentially discrediting your own find kind of makes you more credible. Well, yeah, and there are actually other factors, too. The, um, the ha- Some of the skulls still have hair on them, and the hair is a dark red auburn color, and so genetically, that is, that is not a Native American characteristic. The hair is also much thinner, and it's been analyzed by two hair experts who say it's Caucasian, so it's not Native American. Um, also, if you have red hair, you tend to have light-colored skin, which is not Native American. And if you have red hair and light skin, you tend to have blue or green eyes, which is not Native American. So it's these characteristics that are suggesting that these people came from another part of the world and established themselves on the coast of Peru. And then over the course of a period of time, they weren't able to continue to breed within their small population. So they had to bring normal-looking people in. And so over the generations, the elongated skull would start to look more and more like a normal skull, and that's why the deformation process began. Well, I, I always wonder, wonder if, if that always uh, was a um, not just a tribal or cultural thing, but that was a throwback to on on some kind of ancient understanding of what was previous to their culture. You know, representing you know, uh, you understand what I'm saying, making themselves look like their predecessor, uh, whatever that was, be it humanoid or does that makes sense. Maybe. Yeah, it does. It does. So, you know, like I, in, in promoting this show, you know, like I said, Pat, you know, devils, everyone's going to play devil's advocate when we talk about something like this. So, you know, this, this date is, you know, the date on this is 2000, basically AD. You know, we, not, not to, not to means that that's, uh, disputes anything, but there's just so much more, you know, ancient stuff going on, ancient findings, Gobekli Tepe, et cetera. And we're, we're finding some all the time. So it's really just this crazy thing about history and it's always kind of changing. It becomes this kind of fluid thing. And it just really lets us know how much we don't know, how much we've been lied to. So I have to ask you, sir, again, kind of alluding to what we've already kind of discussed, what would be the purpose of, um, of, of keeping these things under wraps, if you will? Um, there, there's, again, I think almost so much more that we don't know then we know, I think this notion, again, harkening back to the opening, this linear notion of history, I think is a, a, a big kind of fallacy. Um, why? Why lie to us? Why tell us we aren't X, Y, Z if we are, you know, what, what, what's the vested interest of keeping us uninformed? Well, knowledge is power. It's like the, of course, you know, of Graham's work, so you know, of such things as the Piri Reis map that was kept secret for hundreds of years. Um, God knows what the Vatican Library has, um, but it's all about control and that and keeping a certain paradigm in play. So we've been taught and lied to for since we were children that civilization goes back a maximum of six thousand years. Before that, everybody was hunter gatherers, and so through these megalithic works that we're analyzing and seeing signs of lost ancient high technology, it's clear that we have to push history back. Uh, the Paracas people may have been subspecies of, of humanity that died out as a result of attack by the Nazca people. Uh, you also have the Homo florensis uh, Indonesia, um, so the great thing is that now we no longer depend upon uh, a specific class of people called scholars hmm. to tell us to tell us everything. We we can have a conversation with the other seven billion people on the planet, uh, provide evidence and data, and let them figure out what it is that we're looking at. The one thing I do not like anymore, as well, is is when people say, "Well, this should be peer reviewed." The problem is with that is that you're giving the information 
to a very small group of people who were part who of the probably, problem. Or, exactly. Was, did, yeah. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. That's, that's, that's the uh, echo chamber of that's the echo chamber of drinking butters buddies that academia keeps, right? It, it is. It, that's exactly it. But this also and, goes to other stuff we've talked about, like when I, and, and I don't mean to, to just completely sidetrack this, but like police in in when things get tried in certain tribal kind of units, you know, in state kind of, it just becomes this kind of uh, internal. It, I'm sorry, I just kind of hijacked that, but um, yeah, Pat, any any anything else anything you want to hit? Hit our guy with. This has uh, been a very, very fascinating conversation. Yeah, no, I, I mean, while we're on the subject of ancient civilizations and finds and things like that, honestly, Brian, I'd like to know, you know, because I've been curious about this for years, and there's hoax pictures put out there, and then there's other things that I think, you know, I sit there and say, you know, is this real? Um, tell me what your knowledge is on the giant reds that were found in burial mounds in – uh, Minnesota and, and places like that, where they were basically huge, huge people that had red hair that were basically like giant Vikings or something. I don't know if it's true, um, but I'd like your take on that. Oh, on the giants of North America? Yes. Yeah, well, there is, there, I know a number of researchers who were very seriously studying these very tall people, you know, giants is, is, is too much of a, of, of a term because people will think, you know, 30 feet tall or something. But there seems to be a lot of, of data suggesting that there were people existing in the seven to eight foot range who had reddish hair, mainly in the continental United States, that were in conflict with the Native American people. So they weren't Native Americans. They were somebody else. Right. And that the especially the Smithsonian starting in the, I think, the 1880s, put a lot of effort into try to uh, grab any specimens that were in any museums or private collections and hiding them or destroying them. Um, so I, I think it's quite probable that there were um, many other types of humanity that existed in the past, not just us, Homo sapiens sapiens, but other ones that we we systematically took out. When if you look okay. at some of the work of even like well, I hate to bring up Zachariah Sitchin because his work has somewhat been discredited, but he's also alluded to kind of the allegorical things in the Bible. You know, the sons of God having sex with the daughters of men, thus creating this kind of uh, uh, other species, if you will. I mean, there's kind of been coded messages as far as. Um, it's intervention as far as our um, our origins. Yeah, for sure. Well, I uh, I studied Darwinian evolution for four years at university, and I was told that it it's not a theory of evolution. It is evolution. It's what happened, and we're the ones who are going to teach you how it worked. And uh, I actually asked one of my professors, what if I have questions about some of this? He said, you will not have a career. <laughs> so that's, that's the reason I left academia was because I was being closed into this box of limited knowledge. And that's not satisfactory. That's, that's, just, that's crazy that you got literally yeah, threatened. Yeah, so frustrating. It's insane. Yeah. But that's that is emblematic of all of this. When you begin speaking truth to power in this way, when you you know, for lack of a better term, start you know red pilling the populace, this is the kind of this is the kind of response you get. There's you know almost like cancer or medicine. There's no money in the prevention. There's only money in you know treating you. The so-called cure. <laughs> right. Yeah. I, this right. is beyond frustrating. It really is. I mean, because I, especially when it relates to the origin of who we are, because there's, I mean, gosh, how many millions of people have been put into the ground because, you know, based off wars, based off religion, et cetera. It's like, the, the, the um, and pardon my language, well, I'll just say, the mind screwing that has gone on throughout history has been so frustrating. We talk about the political stuff, et cetera, but the larger, larger aspect even is, you know, who are we? Why are we, you know, what's, why do we, where we come from? And there's, so much more that we just don't know. And that's by design. That's very frustrating. And when you try to yeah. bring it up, yeah. you're the crazy person. Yeah, but that's also why why that's we're changing. having this, this, yes. this well that that's why we're having this conversation and that's why we have the right to have this conversation. Um, 
is to waken more people up. Like those that are, in, it, most people probably aren't interested, but those that are interested deserve to have this information given to them. And that's why 90% of, of what I do is free information to the public because um, I have no right or ownership of, of, the, of the data itself. So the world deserves to know, if they're interested, what it is that I'm looking at. Well, I mean, ultimately, the value of what you're learning is it has nothing to do with, you know, monetary stuff, et cetera, et cetera. It really is about the truth and the beauty of kind of, you know, when you start getting into this, it really is a beautiful thing. And unfortunately, we're a society that, that tramples each other for new phones and Black Friday stuff. We're the complete opposite. Don't don't include you and I and our guest in that. We no, stuff. I'm just saying. You know, I mean, it's, <laughs> it's the, the yin yang of it all. But ultimately, I mean, we, we, there are a lot of people who that's what we're talking about is so you know the antithesis of what kind of what the narrative and what society and the social narrative and the social norm is gearing people towards. It's all consumer horseshit. We all know it. We all know this. So right, right. Yeah. This, now let me. Let me circle back to Peru and the petroglyphs. Um, Brian, tell me, you know, there's a lot of petroglyphs down there with three fingers. And I was just wondering if if this is a hoax, is it people just going off the, the petroglyphs that, uh, okay, let's, let's come up with a three-fingered alien-looking creature to make this place even that much better for tourists, uh, you know, thrill-seekers, curious people, whatever. Or is this something that's actually coming true? Because I'm guessing, you know, looking at the petroglyphs, while not uh, anatomically correct, I'm guessing that they were intelligent enough to look at their own hand and see that they had five fingers and draw people with five fingers instead of three, which, you know, I find kind of odd. Had to pull that from somewhere. You're right. What, what are your thoughts no, on that? No, that's... It's, no, that's a, that's a very good point. There has to be a re. There, there's always a reason behind symbolism. It's not a mistake. Um, also, you you find depictions down here of people with six fingers, and so that kind of relates to the whole Nephilim thing as well. So, yes, yes, um, yes. there's there's so much rich history in Peru. Unfortunately, there are not that many archaeologists at work here anymore that's but i'm like a kid in a candy store there's just <laughs> literally a, literally across the street from where i live there's a megalithic site right and and talk about the megalithic site you know we watched um was it your drone flying around showing um the smaller stonework and then the bigger stonework how 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 heavy are these stones uh, the bigger stones how, how much would they weigh well, the largest ones in Peru are actually less than a quarter mile from me. It's a site quite famous called Saxay Waman, and it's a, it's a zigzag wall that has three levels. The largest stones are on the bottom, and then they get smaller as they go up. But the, the largest ones have been estimated at 125 tons. What? That's bigger than the ones at Giza, or the pyramids. Or no, but those two Yeah, actually... The, um yeah well people tend to exaggerate cool. stuff yeah. a lot but still but heavy here, very heavy yeah here you have you know there are a lot that are 10 tons 20 tons 40 tons 60 tons but the largest is there are two of them at a, at 125 tons uh the one is 19 feet tall and the quarry is three miles away wow <laughs> that's some back some back breaking work my friend had some back Very. work. Wow. So how do we how do we explain this? How did they get them there? So what they, I mean, you know, the the explanations that we get are they laid down a bunch of logs and, and just kept replacing logs in front of it and had well, not, not, even them 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 not even just getting them there. Not even just getting them there. If you look at some of the videos that Brian's posted, as far as the the the, the this, whatever the term is of the the lines of the slices in the rocks. You mean you have some of your mortar, mortar-based stuff? What's what's coming the Inca stuff? But then you have some of the stuff that we're talking about, the megalithic stuff. That's like, how are these sliced in such symmetrical fashion? And that's all goes for the same with what's going on in in the the chambers of of Giza or the pyramids. Yeah, that's right. Well, also the the terrain of Cusco is like um, Colorado and Montana, so you, you don't have any any flat area. It also rains here six months of the year, 
and there are no tr no indigenous trees that grow straight. They're all basically shrubs. So there was no wood in order to be able to make rollers out of in the first place. Right. So basically, they're saying that they would have had to have drug 121 stones, 100, 121 ton stones up a mountain. Completely logical. Completely yeah. logical. <laughs> Yeah, and also if you say, well, how many people would it take? Thor Heyerdahl, when he was doing work on Easter Island, estimated that a one-ton block um, to be moved on flat ground took 15 very strong men. So when you calculate 15 times 120, wow. five, and then you have to coordinate them all to pull at the same time, uh, no, it just doesn't, you know, the whole thing falls apart. Is that true they found uh, under Easter Island, just the faces, they found actual, like, lower body, you know what I mean? Like, lower stuff under the face on Easter Island? Is that true? Yeah. Yeah. Every, every one of the stone heads you see or, or you see has a full body. One of them's 40 feet tall. Oh, they're buried underground. Exactly. Yeah. Wow. That's insane. So doing the, math, doing the math on the stone, the 121-ton uh, stone... There would have been almost two thousand people pulling that up the mountain, or flat. Exactly. <laughs> it would have taken twice that to get up a mountain. Big brain yeah, just did the that, calculations. Yeah, and that's that's a lot of rope, and and that's a lot of coordinating. And again, you had nothing to use as rollers, um, unless you made them out of stone. And the Inca only had bronze tools, so they couldn't shape hard stone like that. So, it's it's really easy to. Um, to pick these antiquated theories apart. Uh, the most classic example recently is a site you probably have heard of called Petra in Jordan that was featured in uh, Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade. Yes. Uh, that site is, is 12 kilometers long, or seven miles. So it's not just what you saw with Indiana Jones on the horse, you know, going through the, through the tunnel thing. It's a hundred times that size, and the scholars still insist that it was nomadic Arabs on camels that did the work in a hundred years. Right, and it's and on top of that, it's all buried under like twenty-five feet of sand and sandstone, isn't it? That is solidified over the, you know, the the centuries. Well, there's a, there's an incredible amount of erosion and all these massive chambers. One of them I calculated. Uh, is a hundred feet, but it, like it's a room in solid sandstone of a hardness of seven out of ten, and okay. it's a hundred a hundred feet by a hundred feet by thirty feet tall. So that's three hundred thousand cubic feet of material was removed from that one chamber alone. Wow. Well, and even speaking to you know one of the most recent, like I said, we alluded to earlier, Gobekli Tepe, that's really d shuffled the cards. That's only what a quarter un uncovered. Like there's so much more underground that has yet to be excavated of the, of that of that site. I mean, it's just actually, like, su actually, supposedly thirty times as much as there. It's, they've uncovered one thirtieth of it, right? and they and they they've not found any significant treasures there besides. Like oil lamps and things like that right now. They, do they do they think that most of the treasure, um, or you know, the stuff that would be of historical value and of true monetary value has been stolen over the years before uh, modern man got there? Yeah, probably. It's it's more likely that um, that tombs were not at that exact site itself. You, you find the same thing in Peru. Ancient cemeteries are are not at the ancient locations themselves, um, but are are nearby. Well, there's and evidence sure... that Gobekli was even buried deliberately. Oh, exactly. Yeah, at least ten thousand years ago. It's just, oh. it's so beautiful because it just. I, I that's what I said. I, I love finding out. Like I don't know if you're, you're obviously familiar with Joe Rogan, but listening to Graham Hancock and Russell Carlson on Joe Rogan for like three hours talking about. Just all of it. I'm just like, wow. I mean, there's just so much that we just don't know and need to unlearn. It's it's a beautiful thing, quite frankly. But unfortunately, we're, I think, in the minority when it comes to anybody having a curiosity for these things. Would it be ludicrous to think that all of these stones, say, in Egypt and in Peru, where these pyramids are built, these massive stones have been put into 
uh, perfect order, precision cut, everything else. Is it is it impossible to think that there was um, an unearthly aid in getting all this stuff done? I my mind is open to that. I mean, when we explore Egypt, we find evidence of uh, machine tool marks, <clears throat> including evidence of um, circular saws that were twenty feet in diameter and three sixteenths of an inch thick. We don't have a material to make a saw like that. But wh- um, why does also- it have to be unearthly? I, had, I don't know. I have to just say, I mean, it just, it could have, this is part of the whole nature of kind of what we're talking about. Human beings on this planet had an, had an exceptional potential at one point in time that possibly had nothing to do with off-site extraterrestrial. We just were way more right. hipper to mathematics, cymatics, the understanding of sound and, I mean, there's so many theories as to how these things were built and done. It, I mean, it could just be human. I mean, look at how far we've been dumbed down with, but we have smartphones as we trample people for them. Like, it's, it's, there's evidence that we were pretty smart as human beings back at one point in time. But, you know, there is conjecture. There could be. I just, like, want to say you're, it doesn't necessarily have to be off site. What you're saying is leaning towards the, uh, the ancient lim- library at Alexandria was an arson job. Well, of course it was. <laughs> but sure. what were they hiding? You know what I mean? The point that's the question. What were they hiding? And that's what I asked Brian, you know, why why this? Why this effort to keep us so, you know, blue pilled out, if you understand that metaphor as far as the matrix. It's you know I get it. It is a power move. It is a power move. But I think, you know, conversations like these we are slowly awakening. And something before I let you go, sir, and I'm just it, I have to ask about it because I know Graham Hancock's spoken about it. I know it might be controversial, and you're down in Peru, and it has become quite the almost thing for people in the West or people in America. What are your thoughts on ayahuasca, sir, and its utilization to hopefully, you know, whatever they're doing, awaken themselves, you know, facilitate this larger conversation we're having, just truth of self, et cetera. Um, ayahuasca is a very beautiful and powerful medicine, and um, I've had experiences with it that have been absolutely profound. The problem is that there are only um, a limited number of proper practitioners of it. Um, It takes at least 20 years of experience with ayahuasca to become what's called an ayahuascaro, but there are a lot of... um, sham artists in Peru and and Brazil who maybe have a couple of years experience with it and are not doing a proper service to this very beneficial medicine so uh, just a warning to people who want to experience ayahuasca and it's best to do it in its homeland which is the Amazon area is to make sure that you find a very qualified practitioner who has a minimum of 20 years experience with it yeah that's i mean you know this isn't an advocation of necessarily drug use this is a, the, from what i've understand i've seen i've read i mean you know dmt dimethyltryptamine the active ingredient as well as other things has really helped people veterans etc you know really get through a lot of traumatic experiences and you know just from what i've seen you're absolutely right there's, yeah there's been a lot of people who've been taking advantage of um, who've gone and um, you know just not had the best experience, but I've, there's also been you know from you have a lot of honestly, like I said, a lot of people different walks of life who have done that, who have had miraculous results. Again, everybody walked their own path, but it's worked for a lot of people. Yeah, but I I would say ninety percent of the people don't have a proper practitioner. Um, it can do it can do anything. It can cure cancer. It can cure drug addiction. It can cure childhood trauma. It the, the important thing is that you have to be open to the medicine itself for the medicine to help you. And that's distinguishing the difference between a medicine and a drug. A medicine sure. is something which is completely beneficial. A drug is usually an extract of something, like the difference between coca leaves and cocaine. Sure. You know, coca leaves are very beneficial. Cocaine is not. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, they thought it was in the early days of Coca-Cola, though. Yeah, when they put it in the old good old... Exactly. God, this stuff works. Yeah, it wakes uh... me up. <laughs> sure have a lot of energy. 
Queen Victoria loved it, supposedly, yeah. <laughs> so, uh, Brian, t- tell us, I mean, maybe you don't want to name names because they're powerful people, but are there groups specifically setting out to discredit you, um, to shut you down? Any? Have you run into any of that type of stuff? Uh, not really. I get a, I get occasional attacks from people, um, occasional attacks from academics, but I, I simply, sh- um, shove data in their faces and if, if, um, and they tend never to respond again because that means they actually have, have to look at the evidence rather than base, um, you know, base everything simply on what they believe. If they're not open to learning, then there's no point in being communi- in communication with them. Right, right. And that has to happen pretty frequently, a la, you know, the, 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 what should have been the super fight of super fights. Zahir Careful Rossi. using that name, Allah. Uh, you know, Allah to the stop, Patrick. <laughs> you know, the the Zahi Awas Patrick uh, uh, Zahi Awas Graham Hancock should have been the you know the the serious intellectual duke out of all duke outs because we've all seen it. Like I said, through Robert Bouval, John Anthony West, all of your analysis and work, it's pretty it's pretty cut and dry at this point. So you have to almost obfuscate with horrible PR and media and, you know, horrible ad hominem attacks because, the like you said, the science is just so cut and dry. It's just, you know, just a matter of time. Well, so I'm getting, glad we're having this conversation again. Yeah, it is. It's getting bigger and bigger. Robert Schock, who figured out that this, the erosion on the Sphinx is at least 10,000 years old, He's now been backed up by more than 200 other geologists from around the world. I, I, did I say Boval? I meant shock. I apologize. Well, Boval's great, too. He's yeah. actually going to be here in, in November with us. Nice. Very nice. But that work has just been so amazing. All the series, like Anthony West series, like uh, Mystery Egypt. I mean, it's just it's so illuminating, and it just, it just baits the whole question of, A, how much do we don't know, and, like, B... Man, why are they spending – it does make sense why they're spending so much time keeping us in the dark, but it's just like, wow, they are really keeping keeping us in the dark um, on, on the larger questions, you know what I mean, on, you know, like as we've discussed today. Yeah, but actually the light is growing a lot more rapidly. They're, they can't control anything anymore, as we've seen. Um, so we are winning the battle, and we will be victorious. Absolutely. I like your spirit, sir. I love it. Thank you. <laughs> Patrick, any closing questions for our good friend, Mr. Brian Forrester? You know, I think we've explored quite a bit. We've gotten some, some great answers, and I'm, I'm looking forward to keeping an eye peeled for this big, this big announcement tomorrow. What are your, what are your thoughts that it could be? Um, well, actually, I'm just going to wait and see. My, my wife, luckily, is Peruvian, so... She she monitors all of the um, all the Peruvian TV uh, channels and um, she'll she'll give me a report tomorrow as to what they've actually um, what they're actually going to come up with or, or come out with as compared to what they said they would. Um, again, I'm not on on one side of the fence or the other. I simply want to see what they you know what what actual data they have and then go from there. Okay. Mm, okay. Keeping well, the we'll cards keep our... close to the vest, I see. Mm. A little bit. <laughs> All right, sir. All right. We'll keep our eyes and ears peeled for that, though. Absolutely, man. This, I mean, and and you are obviously welcome back anytime. As this, you know, because it seems like this is a very fluid conversation. All the things they're finding that just kind of like turns the you know, the narrative on its head. So you're welcome back anytime as things develop, sir. Mister, wow. Any Do you have final, any, uh, any yeah, websites, exactly. any websites, any books, anything that you'd like yep. to, to uh, pump? Yeah, actually, the best source is is my website, which is hiddenincatours.com. Okay. And ninety percent of that is free information. I have almost nine hundred YouTube videos up, and uh, the books and everything else are are on there. Um, so people are are welcome for you know to look at all the free content. Beautiful. And we're looking forward to coming down there and hopefully meeting you in person and, and doing some filming ourselves with you. Please do. It'll be a lot of fun. That would be awesome. Man, thank you so, so very much for, for your time and your work. Please continue success with your work. Mr. Brian Forrester has been very gracious with his time here on the Conspiracy Farm. Thank you so very much, and stay tuned, ladies and gentlemen. There will be more.